Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 77 of Glass Onion on John Lennon. We're closing in on the 100 very slowly. And um, I'm delighted to have with me a returning guest and a new guest. Uh, starting with a returning guest. So we've got Ben Burrell, who was on episode 43 and 44 from memory, where we did, we did it. It was John Lennon versus Bob Dylan, but we weren't really pitting them against each other. We were talking about their relationship. So maybe for the listeners or viewers, if you haven't listened to those, you might want to do that first because we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. But anyway, Ben, welcome back, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me back. Um, uh, a pleasure to be here. I've just seen actually on on this Zoom we've got set up, you are looking at my flowery wallpaper. We've moved, we're yeah. renovating this house in Brighton and uh, it was stuck in the 90s. So I just want you, just want you to look at it, just glance at it every now and again when we're talking. Just enjoy it. Just drink it in. And your pink microphone cover. Is that pink oh, or yeah. purple? Yeah. Uh, purple. It's, it's purple, work branded, yeah. but I've, I've turned the work branding away so you don't have to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my coat there, the ever-present coat on the door. <laughs> Looks there. like you're about to make a swift exit at any moment. Well, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Eh? <laughs> um, and also on the show, very special guest, we've got John Stewart, who's the author of a certain book for those video. Show it to the camera. Dylan Lennon, Marx and God. John, welcome to the show, mate. Hi, thank you for having me on. And saying You're very welcome. You, nice to meet you. You're all very welcome. And um, in fact, before we get into it, we've got so much to talk about. We're not going to do too much faffing. But uh, John, I realised uh, after a while that you were also the guitarist. I think you still are, in fact. You've yep. reformed in Sleeper. Yep. Which was a 90s band. And just to make you feel old, because I think you're just slightly older than me. I was watching you. What was I watching? TFI Friday, Salem mm. Century. Remember that one? Yes, uh, vaguely. Uh, yeah. And I do remember watching that because I used to record TFI Friday, the, just the band bits more than the Chris Evans bits. So uh, it was know. a great, great thing to do because there was, um, uh, it, it, it was kind of on the Thames near Hammersmith, and there was a bar at the place, and yeah. that was a real bar where we recorded in. And then there was, you would go over the, you'd record it in the afternoon. Then you go to the pub over the road, opposite the the studio, Teddington Rock Studios, and watch it on the telly in the pub. Uh, oh, yeah, it yeah. was uh, fantastic. Yeah, it was a great thing to do. Actually, it was really cool. We did that. Did that a bunch of times. And I'm also now playing the wedding present as well, which is uh, oh, that's right, yeah, quite. And it, that, and that's the that's the, the band I recorded off the telly when they were on top of the pops. <laughs> <laughs> and in a word, Chris Evans, nice guy, uh, Ginger, Ginger. <laughs> can i say that i don't know that's fine yeah yeah do you have to be afraid of everything we say nowadays but yeah that's yeah. fair enough fair enough john um, i can i can make you feel even older and i can only apologize about this but i think smart was one of the first albums my brother ever bought which means wow. it was one of the first albums i ever heard i can vividly remember that kind of that front cover with um yeah. everyone astronauts. the astronauts yeah yeah yeah, yeah. really oh, good record was, good record oh thank you that was andy's idea he was uh he the drummer obviously and mm. um we uh we realized that nasa this is long before the internet or not long a few years before the internet when mm. I, when everyone could work it out but we realized that nasa stuff was public domain so it would make for a great album cover so it was a free picture which spent quite a long oh. time like, <laughs> yeah and if you go today you can use nasa stuff on anything um mm. this is amazingly it's public domain because it's funded by the american government from taxpayers money so yeah. um yeah, it was a great, great idea for, for an album cover. And was the band named after the Woody Allen film or not? Kind of, yeah. We were big Woody Allen fans, and right. um, I like the fact that it's got common vowels in it. So my, mm -hmm. I have a sort of theory of band names, which is that they're, they're sort of one or two word poems, and internal rhyme is a good one. So it's lots of E's in a row, obviously. And um, it's a word, lots of different meanings. So, yeah, we mm -hmm. cast around for a bunch of names, and I can't remember who came up with it, maybe Louise. And it was just like, yeah, that's a good one. And there hadn't been a band with it with an ER on the end of it for as far as we could ever think. There hadn't been like a band that took a that kind of ER word as a as a as a as a as a name. And then mm. after was a bunch came out, you know, so like feeder and things Weezer. like that. Weezer. Weezer were after you, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. Weezer, feeder, all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. trend setting. 
All right. Um, well, I thought I thought of a question just before we get into the the book and everything. This is for both of you, but I'll start with John. Um, we always hear that the '90s was some kind of revival of the '60s, and you know, very influenced by the music. And I can definitely hear some of that. But like I say, I was listening to some of your songs from that period. And I can't really hear much '60s in Sleeper. So, with Sleeper and maybe with the other bands, your contemporaries, what do you think the '60s influence was? Was it a bit overblown or not? I actually, th- I think it was definitely there. Um, mm. It's it, but as with most bands, I think it depends what the front person wants wants it to be. And Louise was very much um, child of the eighties and Blondie kind of stuff. So it's much more obviously that influence, I think, from her side of things. And um, so the the. 60s stuff is there but it's it's hidden a little bit whereas in other bands like like blur and oasis mm. uh, it does it's just blatant obviously and and often quite skillfully crafted um mm. and it, it everybody was listening to that stuff at the time you know if you were in a band in london you were listening to the kinks and absolutely and, you know their less popular beatles albums like the white album and stuff trying to mm. sort of mind some gold nugget that everybody had forgotten about in a riff or something like that and um it was just a, it was it so it was a revival in that sense and and stylistically it, it because it was it was post grunge really once mm-hmm. Kurt Cobain had, had committed suicide sadly it was obvious that 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 game was up from that side of things and that there was an opportunity for something uh from this side of the Atlantic to take its place so it, it, and, and then once that happened, it was clearly it was going to be 60s influenced in one way or the other. And where it wasn't, you know, where people what people picked up on the early 70s influence, it was people people like Bowie and it, which which were clearly a big influence on maybe Sway or something like that. But mm-hmm. where where people were influenced by you know glam rock, your T Rex influenced songs like some of the Oasis songs, it, it, they just don't quite work. So it's going to be your quality '60s stuff and and your quality '70s stuff, which means you know Bowie and uh, that kind of thing. You know. Yeah, Ben, I forgot to mention uh, to the listeners or the viewers that you're a, you're a DJ with Absolute Radio. Um, you're also somewhat a child of the 90s, more or less, kind of. Uh, yeah, that, that weird age where we sort of grew up a little bit in the 90s, but also in the early noughties. But yeah, sort of half half 90s kid. We're like sort of nomads. We don't really have, we're sort of homeless when it comes to those decades because we were like coming of age right at the end of the 90s. So like right at the end of Britpop and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I do really re- like vividly remember Oasis and just them being the biggest band in the world at that time. Um, but yeah, I agree with what John said. I think it, it definitely has, the 90s have parallels with the 60s. In, but if, in terms of like the way I think like Britain felt and it was like exciting music, uh, mm. whereas like after the 90s, it felt quite different. It just felt like England was sort of being a little bit left behind until we got that kind of great resurgence sort of 10 years later. Um, yeah. There was definitely yeah. a scene, there was definitely a geographically based scene in, in Camden where you could go to any one or two or three pubs any night of the week and you would meet people in bands and um yeah and it was it was great because you you know I, I bumped into pretty much every band in the whole thing in in various pubs because i lived in camden at the time and um it was fantastic and then uh uh yeah just liam we were talking about oasis before liam almost had a fist fight in the street with him gargle one night when he uh he misheard something that someone i was with had said and he'd been all kind about the, the latest video that we'd had out and came over and said how he liked the uh the single and then somebody over my shoulder said something and he uh just turned around and he thought it was me and sort of started on me and I was like wow okay so is it and he was surrounded by people he had you know five or six Manchester mates with him yeah I was like, wow is it worth getting beaten up by Liam Gallagher and his mates for a line in the NME probably not <laughs> so I backed off and uh yeah just crazy stuff like that was happening i suppose it was a scene it was a thing so i think the thing i remember is that um i mean i'm not that much into football anymore but i was at the time and of course we also had euro 96 Mm. if you remember that and of course england had won the world cup in 66 Mm. so there was that weird parallel and you know there's the the three lions song if you remember 30 years of dreaming and everything so i think there was definitely for me it was great because i'd become i had a weird trajectory i i grew up first music I was into was 80s so it's probably stuff like I know Duran Duran and 
definitely the Smiths as well. Mm. And then around 88, I discovered the Beatles and then all current music, well, all other music basically went out out the window for about three years. Um, and then I kind of picked it up again. I liked James, if you remember them, sort of early 90s. And then definitely I, I loved grunge and then I, I kind of picked up current music again. But I remember things like, I don't know, Country House by Blur, I thought was a, mm. was a pretty bad kind of kinks ripoff. Mm. You know? mm. yeah, so that's a bad, that's a bad song. Still yeah. a bad song. They were a good band. I mean, I'm not, not dissing them, but I just remember that one. And I do remember actually Tom York said that the paranoid Android idea came from happiness as a warm gun in the sense mm. of three or four sections yeah, through so, composed. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a great time for me as a kind of a, a 60s kid, not an actual 60s kid, but inside a 60s kid, you finally had a decade that kind of resembled to some extent the 60s. So I mean, it's magical, really. Yeah. Anyway, we've speaking got... of the 60s. Yeah, speaking. Yeah, it's finally a good segue there. <laughs> Great segue. <laughs> you, do, you do the segue. Go on. <laughs> what, what a pro. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> <laughs> right effortlessly moving to john's book so dylan lennon marks and god so i um i devoured this book uh, over the last couple of weeks and ended up nearly writing all of it out as i told you before we started um so we're gonna what we're gonna do we're gonna look at uh, three very broad topics which is uh, anti-war slash protest music history and then spirituality slash religion slash consciousness slash a couple of other things anyway it's enough slashes um but can we start with a perfunctory question so john what was the journey that led to this book and uh, how long did it take to get it written and released yeah it took a, it it started as a phd um i i moved to america after sleeper and then came back in 2000 and started teaching at a local music school here in brighton called bim now called bim institute and it has schools all over europe now but we were the first one and um i just i wanted to kind of build on that writer academic background so started publishing research because we were working with the university of sussex so it's an opportunity to get involved in the research world and I, I wrote some stuff on protest music and the iraq war i was fascinated by the lack of protest music during the iraq war and kind of realized that that was because there hadn't been a conscription move you know if there'd been conscription there probably would have a lot more protest songs yeah. and um and i wrote a bunch of other stuff stuff on joe meek and um yeah ton, tons of stuff really uh I interviewed devo who one of my favorite bands when i was at uni and um did a piece on them with ryan eno and then and then thought i'd do a phd and just couldn't get past my two biggest influences as a kid which was Dylan and Lennon and if you're going to do a big project like that you need to do something you love mm. so I just I, I came across this idea of a dual biography um, there's a, a an American academic called Eloise Knapp Hay who's a literary critic and she she was the first person to write about the idea of how powerful a dual biography can be and the, the point there being that, that you can learn more about the individuals concerned if they have an interesting enough relationship than you would with a single biography. And it just seemed blatant that of, of all the musicians in, that I loved from the 60s, Dylan and Lennon were the two most charismatic and they bumped up against each other just enough for it to be a relationship, but not enough for it to be a, a friendship, like with Dylan and Harrison, for example. Yes. And, um, and, and, and there was just so many different points of comparison. That I settled on this dual biography idea, and, and it's become quite popular. There's quite a lot of dual biographies now. There's a, there's one on uh, Dylan and Shakespeare that's just come out. Um, oh wow! Well. Uh, there's been one on Dylan and Leonard Cohen, but no one had done the obvious one. Um, so I did it as a PhD. So that's why it's got that academic framework. But also, I, I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't just biography. I wanted to do something that was a bit more analytical and conceptual, which is essentially what. PhD involves some element of theory and um, I wanted to do something that doesn't often happen in popular music which is take cultural theory and actually apply it to to the world to say this is meaningful or not you know quite a lot of that stuff's just blue sky thinking and very rarely does anybody do a, a proper meat and potatoes application to what what does this say about the real world so I wanted it to be 
weighty like that. And then um, my supervisor, who's uh, Laurie Strauss, is um, award-winning writer in her own right on music. She um, she just gave it to her, the, her editor at Cambridge University Press said, have you got anything interesting going on? And she sent her my script and they jumped on it. So during the pandemic, I tidied it up a little bit, although to be honest with you, not that much from what the original PhD script was. It still it still reads quite academically, but I think I wanted to keep that in there because it, it seemed quite valuable. Mm. And it was a bit extra for people that are just, people that have read, read all the biography, like, like I have, of those two characters. It's something yeah. that hopefully thinks about it in a new way. So. I mean, it really does, because I mean, I, I've been a Dylan and Lennon fan for 30 years, and I was, mm. when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh yeah, these are angles that I haven't come across. Um, Ben, when you were on last time, uh, did we reach the conclusion that Lennon and Dylan were somewhat similar, maybe not in the specifics, but character-wise? Is that what we came to, would you say? Yeah, I think so. I think that's that's why that it's interesting that you've done this, John, because I think they didn't really have, as you say, like a, a massive relationship. They didn't actually meet like that many times, mm-hmm. um, but they seem to be like ships in the night. They'd always, they they seem to have some sort of like relationship that was beyond like physical and beyond like just being friends. It was almost like they, I think you say like they were similar characters, but it was almost like mm. their destinies were somehow interlinked. Um, and I think they felt like kind of two sides of, of a coin to use a terrible phrase. Yeah. Um, but I think that and also their careers, similar things happened to them in their careers. And I think that that's why, they are linked because they could relate to each other. And I think they, Bob Dylan can probably relate to very few people on this planet. And I think John Lennon was one of them. Um, so I think that's kind of what makes them really interesting when you look at them both together. Um, and also they sort of had like, it was almost like they they went in different directions and crossed over in the middle um, yeah. with regards to their career. And, and we'll obviously get into that later. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating to look at them together because they are similar, but very different people at the same time. They were kind of linked by the phenomenon of fame, which a, a lot of academics like to study. And um, mm. and there's these moments when they met that have gone down in history, like when Dylan allegedly introduced them to marijuana, which mm. might have been the first time they smoked grass, but certainly wouldn't have been the first time they smoked. They had cannabis. Mm. Um, in fact, Lennon was writing about it in his books months before he met Dylan. Um, and, then, and then other times when they met, or like at the the time they met in '66 at the Royal Albert Hall, and and when they when Lennon went to Dylan's house, and that you two spoke about in the previous podcast, and um, in the taxi, yeah, yeah, and they went <laughs> riding Dylan's limo, and we were chatting about it before the start. The they wrote about each other in their songs quite a lot, and um, mm. that line, the picture of you in your wheelchair, which I I really picked up on on the last podcast you did. Um, and went and looked for a picture of Lennon in a wheelchair. It's from um, fourth time around, isn't it? When when Dylan is singing about Lennon because Lennon's been singing about Dylan, so it's Dylan doing Lennon doing Dylan. Absolutely. And yeah. um, Lennon Lennon's copying Dylan's style, and Dylan's commenting on his copying his style. And you made the point that uh, he used the line uh, about the crutch, and that Lennon had had crutches in his house and. There's that line mm. about the picture of you in your wheelchair, and there's a, a famous picture of Lennon from Help, where he's in a wheelchair. And I, I I'm, I think that must have re- that's probably why the song really got to John because I, just feel, Dylan must have seen that, logged it, made a mental note, um, and, and put it in the song afterwards, which I just think is a mark of his songwriting genius. And their relationship, which is mediated through song and through publicity. Through mm. movies and you know other pe- people like us talking about them more than it is about their own relationship, which seems in some ways quite stilted. Um, yeah, and uh, I just I just thought that I learned that from your podcast, and I was I was telling you before we started, I, I wish I'd heard it before. That was just as I was doing the final version because it would certainly be in the book. Um, and I was saying we wish that as well. We wish that as yeah. well. <laughs> great observation. Um, yeah. And now I, it's quite hard to write new things about them, but there's a few in there, and that, that would that's certainly one. Um, so as far as, as far as I'm aware, no one's put those things together and made made a thing out of it. Um, it's amazing you found the photo because we were kind of half speculating about it because there's been a yeah. rumor about it, and, and when you look at the lyrics, it, it does kind of match up, and and the songs do match up. I mean, mm. you know, it, it it does sound like 
Norwegian Wood is a little bit of a, of a mm. Dylan-esque song and, yeah. and that would have annoyed him definitely um but for you <laughs> to find the photo is it's kind of it's amazing really and yeah. what a photo it is yeah well, it's, it's 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 Lennon being his favorite Peter Sellers character as well so it makes sense that he would have had that picture somewhere in the house you know yeah, I mean, I remembered that scene. I haven't seen Help for years, but mm. there's that scene where they're all in disguise. And I remember that John Lennon looked a bit like he did in 69, but I'd forgotten he was wearing granny glasses. Yeah, Absolutely mad. I mean, of course, there's a possibility that there's some tie-in with him getting the glasses from How I Won the War mm. and that scene, but it seems a bit of a coincidence. And it's and I was telling you also, there's a there's a rumour. I mean, it's never actually been seen, but when he was at primary school, John Lennon was at Dovedale Primary School. He drew a picture of Jesus Christ that looked basically the same as him in 69 without the glasses. So <laughs> it all goes around, but you got the you've got the double meaning of crutch, of course, as well. Mm. Word plays all over these guys' songs. And I think the other thing we concluded maybe was that this was my kind of pop psychology, was that when you when you when you when you see someone who's a bit too similar to you, maybe you do want to keep them at arm's length mm. somehow. Yeah. You know, maybe because they reflect too many things. Like, because I think these two guys are, I think we agree that they're very kind of mercurial, they're very changeable, contradictory, which is not a bad thing because it makes them so interesting. You know, It'd be boring if they were predictable, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think they were really, I think they were quite competitive too, especially I think uh, underneath it all, Dylan was quite competitive with, with Lennon, even though he probably didn't outwardly show it. And I think because Lennon was, really commercially successful and, and Dylan was but but not in the same way mm. um and I think when you when you hear him asked in interviews especially in in that kind of mid-60s period when you hear Dylan speaking in interviews about Lennon it's always quite guarded and and slightly cagey I think he feels like he's probably the only person in, in the world that is is out he could outdo Dylan um or mm. is matching him um and the and the, the whole you know early morning ride when they're both not should we say not in the best way uh to yeah. put it lightly um i think dylan there's more than a couple of reports saying that he felt quite embarrassed after that and he apparently stopped the car and he was sick in in the hotel and he, he felt that was you know he embarrassed himself there in front of lennon i think he not directly because of that but i think he was always quite wary about being like that in front of someone like john lennon but I think that's a mark of the genius as well, because that's the same time when he saw that wheelchair picture. So not only did he uh, note the crutch in the wheelchair and go, I'm going to put that in the lyric of the song I'm already writing that Lennon doesn't know about. Mm. He then got so completely pissed that he threw up in the car on the way back <laughs> and still remembered the wheelchair picture the next day. Oh, nice. that's, an, that's an outstanding, that's an athletic <laughs> pop stardom on his part. Well, maybe he walked around with a notebook. You never know. How it kept yeah, in his top that's pocket, possible. Yeah. yeah, maybe he had a little note. Yeah, that would be... Yeah. That would be the, the more practical uh, approach. That's probably what happened. But I, I like to imagine that he just somehow remembered it through the fog. Yeah, the uh, waking up, that's all you can remember. <laughs> yeah, the superhuman yeah. songwriting powers that allowed him to, uh, to remember it. It's like the anecdote about the musician who's being interviewed. And um, the, it's a true story. I, I can't remember who, who the people are, but they're basically the, the journalists are just going you know you've got this amazing talent and it's just so beautiful Wh where do you think it comes from and the, the musicians like practice um, yeah. um but you just you just seem to capture something so amazing and emotional and it's almost like you're touching into what it means to be human and the musicians like yeah practice four hours a day <laughs> and so because free free phrases the same question every time and the answer is always practice yeah and um uh I practice, I was going to say, I practice reflecting the human condition four hours a day. Yeah, yeah I just practice, practice scales, <laughs> practice notes, I get my tone right, it's, you know. And uh, and uh, and I think the same is true with the Dylan thing. Maybe the answer is just notebook. Yeah, uh, note everything got down. Did all that, yeah, notebook. You just wrote in a notebook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's a little clip, actually. There's, a, there's about a minute of it in 4K, and it's quite interesting to see it right, really, really clear. John Lennon doesn't actually look that bad. I don't think he was mm. in terrible condition, but he actually said in an interview, and uh, if you're aware of the 1970 Rolling Stone interview, nearly all of it is hyperbole, so you have to take it with a cellar of salt. But he said, you know, we were both on junk and in mm. shades. Maybe when he said on junk, he just meant they'd taken some drugs, I don't think. May not have meant it literally, but I think we described it as a missed opportunity. I don't know. What do you mm. think, John? Maybe. I, I think there's loads. I mean, there, there, there's a couple of times when they were in almost in a position to write together. Mm. 
one was at, at the, after the Isle of Wight festival when Lennon was recording and invited Dylan to take part and he didn't. And then the second one, which isn't talked about very much, was in New York when Lennon had moved to New York and was making an album with David Peel, the protest singer, yeah. and was 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 hanging around with the Bob Dylan Liberation Front who wanted Dylan to get more political again and actually wore the badge, you know, the pin button for a yeah. while before publicly disowning that movement because they were basically stalkers and, and harassing Dylan. Um, and they were barking at the wrong tree because as we were chatting about earlier, I think Dylan's probably much more conservative than, than they realised. But um, possibly even then. But uh, yeah, so so there were those moments, and uh, the New York one's interesting because if it's if David Peel, I spoke to David Peel before he died um, by email. I had quite a lengthy email correspondence with him, and was going to fly to New York and meet him, and in the end, it never came off. But um, he 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 stands by. It, it's in the Jan one of the books, not Jan Weiner, one of the books. Oh, John Weiner. John Weiner, yeah. Come, oh, come those, books, those books are great. He's such a yeah, good Yeah, my favourite Lennon books, actually, of all yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. they're quite balanced. And it's in that that he goes, Dylan turned up at the studio where he's, where he's making this David Peel album, including the, the song that Peel's written about Dylan, and that caused Dylan to walk out. So um, just, you know, and why wouldn't you? <laughs> I, I think when you're in his position, you're such a public figure, particularly when you're on your own, you do get very guarded around people. And um, so I guess there was an opportunity in the way that Dylan and Harrison became friends because they had something in common. But at the same time, they were rubbing up against each other, perhaps ego wise and, and in other ways. Mm. And there's always a bit of instability, I think, in your personal life. Uh, and um, when you're in that situation, because you're you're so vulnerable all the time to yeah. things going wrong with with those relationships and mm. you know you see that now even when someone texts something to somebody that's inappropriate and then it gets out in the public realm so how it must have been to be so incredibly well known in the 60s and um the, the pressures that that people were under in that respect in terms of the public life you can understand why someone like dylan would be very guarded around his friendships and things like that absolutely um well, let me uh ben let me ask you about this because this is something else in the book this is actually McCartney and Dylan rather than Lennon and Dylan. Uh, the idea that uh, there were rumours, I don't know, 10 years ago or something that they might have written together. But I, I think John made the point, and I definitely agree with this, that perhaps Dylan would have been the only person that McCartney would have written, could have written with that was anything like, that he would have anything like the respect that he had for John Lennon. And also Lennon and Dylan had another thing that they weren't so much melody writers and their melodies. Did you, what was the word you said? Horizontal, wasn't it? Yeah, they're, they're kind of horizontal and vertical. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the chords move underneath them in interesting ways. And a lot of that, in fact, comes from uh, John Lennon's uh, love of uh, marijuana because his friend Pete Shotton wrote a book in the 80s. And he said, John Lennon would sit at the piano sort of a bit high and just sort of move his fingers around. So he tend to sing one note melodies and then move the left hand down and get all these intricate chords that sound really fancy, but in one level, they're just a stone guy moving from a major chord to a, a fancy chord by moving his fingers and stuff. But uh, Ben, what do you think about McCartney Dylan? How would that work? R writing yeah. partnership? Uh, well, maybe it would have worked, but um, I don't know. I don't, I think they feel so different, like, McCartney feels it's interesting I you know it's interesting that Dylan became friends with Harrison because I can see I can see that fit and I, I maybe I can't even put it to words but it just feels like George Harrison's songs would fit better with Dylan Dylan's vocals and they did indeed fit better when he co-wrote with with him mm. um McCartney I just feel like is so far removed from Dylan's process and world I just feel like he's he's probably if you're gonna you know think of people who are as good as each other you probably put them in the same bracket yeah. but I feel like McCartney's just the opposite end to the spectrum to Dylan in almost mm. like every way I feel like it, I, not that McCartney wasn't intellectual you know of course he was but I feel like he kind of has a, a, a he, his approach to music is very different to Dylan's I think Dylan at times didn't really care about you know what was particularly going on music wise as long as it was good and as long as he liked it whereas I think McCartney's probably not like that mm -hmm. um and i think they're just very different people mm -hmm. i could just never see them being together particularly in that way and i think you never really got the sense from uh everything i've heard about mccartney that he was a 
Dylan fan, whereas almost all the other Beatles sort of flirted with a, a love for Dylan in one way or the other, whether it was like a, like a rivalry love or, you know, in George Harrison's case, a genuine, never-ending, gushing love. Mm. Um, <laughs> whereas McCartney always seemed to be a bit like, don't yeah. really care, <laughs> which but is quite McCartney interesting. Makes, McCartney makes a very revealing mistake in an interview where he talks about how they had Dylan's first album when they were in Paris. And this is an interview from later in his life. And it wasn't mm. Dylan's first album. It was his second album. And how we oh, yeah, the first free album. Wheeling, yeah. Yeah, free wheeling. Free wheeling. Yeah. Second album. <laughs> if you make that mistake, you're not. That's the difference between a real Dylan. London would never have gone. Yeah, Dylan's first album, free wheeling. I don't mm. feel he would have said that. But Harrison certainly wouldn't. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I think the point I'm trying to make in the book is that their songwriting styles are quite similar. So Lennon was famously this 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 counterpoint to McCartney's saccharine um, mm. style. But they grew up together. They had a long relationship. They weren't quite at school together, but they were at college together. You can, you, today you can go to Lipper, the music school in Liverpool, and see the courtyard where they used to hang out at lunchtimes together. And, yeah. um, and, and so they had that long relationship whereby when you get two really contrasting styles, the songwriters are writing nose to nose and, and they make it work. And it, the jigsaw shouldn't fit, but it does. And that's what the magic of the Beatles, I think. Whereas McCartney and Dylan, the styles would have been contrasting in a similar way, the more direct one note writer and the melodic writer, but they didn't have the personal relationship to sit down and make it work. So I, I think Ben's right. I don't think it, and on paper, it should have worked much like McCartney, Lennon McCartney did. But in reality, I don't think it would have done because they they didn't have the personal relationship to make it, to make that kind of difference a reality i, I suppose although we do have pneumonia ceilings can you tell us all about that briefly? yeah that's so that's the <laughs> that's the song that never existed but yes, it turned yes. into an actual song which i love it's still it's good name good name i like it people believed it right they believed that that happened well not necessarily people but michael gray who is a brilliant dylan scholar a superb dylan scholar and wrote the bob dylan encyclopedia both volumes of it and for some reason I met him and he didn't, didn't want to talk about it, so, which is perfectly understandable. And, and I want to say right now, I have nothing but absolute total respect for Michael Gray. Uh, as a scholar, I've got all his works and I think he's brilliant. And I, 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 I love his writing. But the fact that the, the idea that Dylan and Lennon and McCartney collaborated on a song is so beguiling and so tempting that yes. we just it, the will to believe overcomes our rational you know is this really true thought processes our will to investigate and verify because it's just such a tempting thing to have existed and he wrote that as a it was in a novel uh about the Beatles, and then it, it appears in the Bob Dylan encyclopedia twice in both editions. So now it's in an encyclopedia. So it's a it's a thing. It's a postmodern yeah. fact, right? Which I love the fact that we want Dylan and Lennon to have collaborated. Uh, it's so brilliant. And then of course people have written versions of the song that never existed. So there's two versions of it on Spotify. Oh right. One of which uses the original. Dylan Lennon lyrics that never existed, Isn't which of that, course you, you couldn't do if, if that was real because there'd be copyright on those lyrics. <laughs> this is, it's perfect for this current era we're living in, that if yeah. you just say something enough, it just does become it's true. true. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You can yeah. just will it, can't you? Yeah. You can will it's, it to be true. It's the ultimate in relativism. It's like, yep, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I want this to be true. So, I mean, and that's the point I'm sort of making around, the, I mean, the fact that Michael Gray included it by accident is is completely incidental it's the fact that really what that says about how we wanted them to work together more i mean i first read that and i was like, oh my god that's incredible i wanted to believe it just as much as michael did so that's that's the real revelation i think can you imagine if it'd been written it i was gonna say can you imagine if it'd been written in that taxi though that Oh, oh, not, not the taxi, sorry, the limo, whatever they read. Yeah, yeah, in the limo. Yeah. yeah. I mean that, you know, I think that's possibly what um yeah, uh, who knows? And that did happen. You know, Lennon met Yoko and the first night they spent together, they recorded Two Virgins, didn't two they? Two Virgins, yeah. Which is which is which is a beautiful thing to have happened. So yeah. Yeah. Go on, Ben. What were you gonna I say? I was gonna say about um 
you know McCartney and 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 Dylan not refitting I think it's also from well McCartney I don't think was particularly interested as much as the others were in Dylan I I don't think Dylan was as interested in McCartney as maybe he was in Lennon or or even Harrison and there's that you know that he infamously went to to John Lennon's house didn't he all all these like decades later to look around in apparently in a hoodie and didn't didn't, went along with the group and didn't expect any um any special treatment which is kind of interesting yeah um but he you know there's there's no reports of him going to you know Paul McCartney's house or anything like that apparently he got off the bus before it's before McCartney's house which is (laughs) incredible because because McCartney's house is really worth a visit um definitely just as interesting as the Lennon house for different I ways. think that that's I think that he he feels some sort of kinship with yeah with Lennon for all the reasons we've mentioned I think he probably you know he's Dylan says he's not a nostalgic person but I think he he probably is oh, even though he yeah. hates to admit it um and that's why I think you know he he does stuff like that to 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 he goes to these places to, to kind of work out whatever questions he's got in his head and there's an amazing story um I've just I've been writing this this um uh Bob Dylan thing for um, this American production company it's going to be an audio drama in fact by the time it goes out it, it, this goes out it'll be out um, oh. and they were looking for kind of like new stories to tell a, a bit like you were saying John they just want new stuff and it's not an unknown story but um, it's a great story that Dylan went back to his childhood house one day and just turned up on the doorstep and the woman that bought the house from Dylan's mum let him in and he apparently looked around for a little bit went down to the basement had a little look around there went to his bedroom looked to there and she said oh your mum left these plates here all these years ago and he, he apparently took a plate home with him <laughs> but i think it's the uh, same as the same as the kind so of Lennon bad. thing yeah it's the same it's, he's going there to look for some sort of meaning and i think yeah. clearly the the lennon house held some sort of something he wanted to investigate whereas the mccartney house obviously <laughs> didn't He's getting and off the he bus. Subsequently, wrote "Roll on, John," not "Roll." Yeah, on, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it could, like? you know, it could be because obviously John Lennon's not around, and and you know, I think if he he, he can pick up the phone and talk to McCartney, I think if he wants to, but obviously it's yeah. John Lennon's a uh, different story. You hit on something interesting because I think John Lennon would the popular perception would be that he wasn't nostalgic either, and that like Dylan, he was all for moving on to the next thing, and there's definitely truth to that. But then, you know, he was nostalgic. He took Yoko back to his to his home. He had a, this is in the Goldman book, and uh, anything nice in the Goldman book is probably true. Yeah. Among all the rest of the stuff in the Goldman book. But he had a chest or something with Liverpool written on it and a few yeah. prized possessions. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing. It's another, another similarity we found there. It's nice. All right. Okay. So we've got these three broad topics. So let's talk about anti-war protest music. Now, the most fascinating thing, and I kind of knew this, but your book really fleshed it out, was this opposite trajectory they had. Mm. So you identified uh, magnetic, rhetorical, and introspective. Um, Maybe I can describe them and tell me if if they're correct, all right? So magnetic is essentially a finger-pointing song. So it would would have a sing-along chorus, simple lyrics, uh, looking at a problem and offering a solution. Is that more or less right? And yeah. then re- rhetorical, well, if we go to introspective, the third one is a very, very abstract, sometimes called a hallucinatory. Mm-hmm. Think of a song like maybe Tombstone Blues, yeah. Dylan or John Lennon ones. What would it be? I don't know. All You Need um, Is Love, maybe. Or, All You Need Is yeah. Love, yeah. The word. Then, the word, yeah. Then middle, what got, the word, well, it says what the word is, but it doesn't imply what love being the opposite of war i suppose yeah. yeah and then so what's rhetorical the one in the middle how would you describe that so rhetorical will be something that identifies a problem but doesn't really suggest any solutions so okay. magnetic is old school protest music yes. essentially this is all drawn drawn from um our serge denisov who was a sociologist who wrote mm-hmm. in this marxist sociologist who wrote in the 60s about protest music and he he was lamenting the loss of the old school protest music and um, your magnetic stuff, as he called it, was draws attention to a problem and gives you a solution. And the key point for him as a Marxist-Leninist is that the solution needs to be class-based uh, action. So union-made would be probably the, you know, you can't scare me, I'm part of the union, would be yeah. a perfect example of that. And by the time you get to the mid-60s, that's disappeared and everyone's doing what he called rhetorical protest, which is, here's a problem, 
don't feel very good about it, but I don't know what the solution is, which might be blowing in the wind, maybe. Yes. And um, and and the be- what what happens is Dylan starts writing as part of the folk movement, revival movement. Uh, he starts toying with with the more magnetic end of the spectrum, and um, because he wants to he wants to disassociate himself from politics, very quickly moves into rhetorical and then completely introspective protest where you're not even sure if it's a protest song. It's just this kind of series of visions. And he does that in the space of about a year. Uh, Whereas Lennon does the opposite. Lennon, because he's in the world's biggest boy band, he can't write political songs. So it's all abstract. It's like the word or, or, you know, later on, all you need is love, which is slightly more conspicuously a a peace song. Mm. Um, Or uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, which I think is quite a, a hallucinogenic, song about you know peace and and coming to terms with yourself and not, and not you know not being caught up in in the in in worldly realities in a harmful way and um and then that moves more and more into old school abstract protest and by the end of the 60s when Dennis was writing he's like John Lennon's the last person holding the torch for old school magnetic protest he's gone the up so Dylan goes from magnetic old school protest to to abstract who knows what songwriting that's quite vague and Dylan excuse me Lennon goes the opposite way from abstract because of his position in the Beatles to then the the campaignery becomes after Imagine when when he writes sometime in New York City which is an entire album of of old school protest which 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 Yoko actually describes in a in very uh, old school protest terms she talks about the history of protest music and how they wanted to do something that fitted into that scheme so that their, their journeys intersect around about 1965 as yes. London's becoming more political Dylan, Dylan is moving away completely from it and would like to say you know how do you know I'm, I'm even against the war and then in his memoir famously uh, cites Barry Goldwater as, as his favourite yeah. uh, 60s politician which uh, or, none, no one I speak to wants to believe like oh well, he's just trolling I'm like well maybe it's his memoir maybe he's maybe he's truthful who do we who knows you know but the fact that he said it yeah. is an indicator that maybe he's more conservative than we like to think and songs like Union Sundown which you know uh, Le- Lennon goes right through the, that trajectory and then retires from politics because it's all getting too difficult after he yeah. fails to overthrow the Nixon government. Um, and then is famously obviously assassinated for it, in part because of his political stance as well as, well as his, his kind of anti-Christian statements. Um, mm. Whereas Lennon, whereas Dylan has retired from politics pre- precisely because he knows the dangers associated with it. He's He's depicted on magazine covers with other political figures, many of whom have been assassinated already or who will be or who have been targets of assassination, like Malcolm X and JFK. And he's like, whoa, I'm stepping back from that. So he's much more cynical and and aware of the realities of American politics, uh, whereas I think Lennon's much more naive when he moves to New York and ultimately pays the price. And then Lennon, you know, Dylan goes on to write... um, Union Sundown, which is basically sort of protectionism. It's almost like a Donald Trump sort of America First song. Mm. Wow. You read Union Sundown, it's literally American industries being destroyed by cheap consumer products from Asia. It's literally what the lyrics are. And yeah. um, you know, it's fascinating that 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 he takes that journey. And uh, and he's also in pro Israel, you know, neighborhood bully and stuff like that. Mm. Trump being the president who moved the capital of Israel to, or the American embassy to Jerusalem, mm. you know, very very close ties with with Israel. So there's a kind of a comparison there that no one wants to draw, and I don't draw that in the book either. But I do feel that he Dylan his emphasis on family and tradition and uh, particularly family. And individualism in American, the importance of individualism yeah. in America is that's what Dylan's all about. Whereas Lennon's more about class, which is kind of their approach to the past, but it comes through in their protest too. And um, just, I think he's possibly a, li- a little more, co- more complex politically than most fans, including myself, would like to give him credit for. Wow. 
Go on, Ben. What do you think? A lot, a lot to unpack. A lot to unpack. <laughs> yeah. um, I agree with, with all of it pretty much. I think, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, Dylan at the start, well, he famously said, didn't he? And, and forgive me, the actual quote I always get wrong, but he famously said, you know, I, I just did those finger pointing songs to to jump into that scene. And he's basically saying, you know, I just did that because, well, that's what was the thing that everyone was doing at the time. And, and, I wanted to be recognized. I wanted to be, you know, advance my career. So why wouldn't I do that? Yeah. And he says that as he goes into record another side of Bob Dylan, which is sort of the first time he's publicly going away from those protest songs. Um, mm. And I think he, he was probably quite idealistic in his youth, probably quite left leaning. And I don't think he was lying to us or creating a character in those songs, but I think he became a poster boy for that, that way of thinking so quickly. And, you know, I said before we start recording, this is how I always sum it up. I think he was he was very political for a few years early on in his career, and he spent the entire rest of his existence, still to this day, trying to get rid of that image and trying to get rid of that yeah. that voice of a generation, you know, hippie tag. And I, he's, I, I don't think he's ever been a hippie, really. Uh, but people think, oh, he's this kind of, you know, super left guy and ban the bomb he's not like that at all he's you know he's like he famously sang last uh, two years ago i contain multitudes and that's i think what that song was about mm. you know it's it's about him saying well you know i i believe this but i also believe that i don't think you know he sits at home wearing a maga hat um and if he does then that you know i'm out i'm sorry um, no he's not he's me. not kanye <clears throat> no he's not gone kanye but do you know what actually i think if if you know if he'd have grown if dylan was starting his career now you know, he could have gone the way of Kanye because, you know, he, I think he would have gone, he would have gone mad because mm. there was such an intense pressure on him yes. uh, and, and people wanted to hear so much from him. And I think this is probably where he is a little different to John Lennon uh, in, in terms of there was much more hysteria around him in, in America because America's got not more problems in the UK, but there's, there's a lot more going it's all on. Bigger. It's all bigger, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And it's, yeah. you know, it's got, a, it's got a complex history and we have a complex history as well, but we tend to, you know, in a very British way, just sort of just, you know, hide it and just don't talk about it and ignore it. Yeah. Whereas America, you know, they, they have to discuss it. And, and, you know, I think Dylan became, you know, the one that everyone wanted to hear from because he was, he was famous and, and people felt that he, he had to say, he ha you've got to speak about this because you've sung these songs. And, yeah, you know, so that can make it. it. Yeah, and that's the thing. And he was good at it. it. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that, that was the problem. Phil he was always... Phil Ives yeah. just cringe. And then Dylan comes along and he's humorous and handsome and all those things. I think the problem, the problem was he was too intelligent. And, yeah. and, and now, and, and after people realized how good he was and, and the things he was saying were true, they wanted to have his opinions on everything. You know, they literally, I think journalists sat down with him in 64 and 65 and literally thought, well, this man's going to tell me the meaning of life. And this man's going to yeah. tell me if there's a God or not. And of course he's, you know, he's a kid. He's in his early twenties. Like he's not got the answers. He's got the answers to some things, but um. Yeah, I think he's he's much more complex than than that image, and and I, I always find it a little bit troubling with Dylan that that I think your average person in the street still thinks of him as this acoustic singer songwriter, whereas he uh, you know he's singing about you know bombs and JFK and and you know he still obviously touches on those things, but he hasn't been like that for you know about seventy percent of his career. He, he's yeah. he's not just that guy, and and you know it's like we were saying, like I was saying, he, he contains multitudes. He's not just you know a, a left leaning singer songwriter. He's a guy who's now in his eighties, and he's you know he's not always going to be that young guy we thought he was. Um, but I think it's interesting you, you talk about the types of protest songs, and <clears throat> excuse me, I think the the trajectories between Dylan and Lennon were were fascinating because Dylan kind of was shrugging off this protesting a tag as as Lennon was just starting to kind of pick it up um but I think Dylan used protest songs to to get to where he wanted to be but I also think like you say John I think he he never stopped singing about things that he found interesting in terms of social issues and I think mm -hmm. Tombstone Blues is the perfect example of that I mean it's a it's a song that it is is kind of shrouded in, in mystery. You don't really know what it's about, but there's that great passage about the commander in chief and mm. he answers him whilst chasing a fly. And, and there's that great line about the commander in chief saying that the sun's not yellow, it's chicken. Mm. And that's that whole section is a, is a like a protest song section, mm. but yes. it's not, you know, the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll or, 
you know um hollis Eddie, brown or yeah something hollis like brown or something like that yeah. he's not saying you know god this is awful this happened but you know he i think by this point he's probably thinking i don't want people to really know what i'm singing about so i'm gonna throw a whole heap of stuff in there and also you know he's taking a lot of drugs at this time you know he's he's on the amphetamines as well which which aids that um mm. but i think it, it, he doesn't stop singing about social issues but he definitely wants to get rid of that that tag of being a protest singer and and i can completely see why can i tell you my favorite quote from the book in fact there's this song that i wasn't aware of called you play boys and playgirls which you said was probably mm. the most magnetic and he sang it with pete Seeger. <laughs> Yeah. Pete Seeger said, by the end of this year, a million people are going to sing this song. And you said something like Bob Dylan made sure they didn't. <laughs> he never, never <laughs> by immediately it. distancing himself. It yeah. doesn't appear in his collection of lyrics. It's yeah. one of his great lyrics. It's what, for me, it's, it's one of his greatest early protest songs. It's really similar to kind of that blowing in the wind anthem. Seeger, who is America's, you know, protest music giant, um, was absolutely bought into it they sang it together at the at the, at the, the folk festival um uh, the first time they performed together that's a one decent recording of it and Seeger's just just loving it hmm. um but yeah dylan never recorded it and the lyrics don't don't appear in any of his collections of lyrics and he's basically eschewing it i think that and let absolutely. me die in my footsteps which is an amazing anti new great song as well yeah, great I mean, song these are incredibly these are just brilliant pieces of work and they just disappear from his catalogue. I, I do love that about him though, that he just, mm. once he's made the decision, he's just like, I'm out, like no going yeah. back. Mm. And he, yeah. like, like I said, I think he is, he is really nostalgic, but I think he's not nostalgic about his work particularly. I think mm. he just thinks like, once that's over, it's over. Well, I'll tell you what it is. I think what, having worked with a few songwriters and singers, I think they're not always the best judge of their own material in terms of its strength, because you're just too close to it. So I've worked yeah. with, with a couple of artists, uh, not Louise or David, actually, another band I worked with were in Brighton. And he was a great songwriter, the, the, the singer of the band. And his best songs, he'd just get bored of them. He'd be like, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm like, oh, man, this is the one that we can get on the radio. And yeah. I, I do think that there's an element of you just get too close to it to to really realize what you've done particularly simple mm. songs they're, they're a bit you know boring to sing compared to the more complex stuff and um i love the complexity of dylan you know he's not he's obviously not a trump fan but at the same time he wrote union sundown which is a which is an amazing song about protectionism and and and, and the destruction of the american industrial economy and mm. he wrote neighborhood bully which is you know a pretty articulate expression of, 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 of his position over, over Israel at the time. And mm. then also he didn't, he still came up with amazing one-off. He wrote George Jackson. Mm. That's so, a great song. so which, which, you know, it's just a, for me, one of his best songs and has been covered brilliantly by some African-American artists as well. Mm. It's a couple of soul, really great soul versions of that. So, um, yeah, I just I think you just got to admire the the genius of the of of the guy who can write you know learns from Death of Harry Carroll at such a young age and and loads of other songs and still be doing that decades down the line along as long with a, a lot along with a huge collection of pretty credible even Christian songs you know I, I don't have any faith but and I hated that stuff when it came out but um, I listened to it now I see that's that's quite good I mean in the gardens a cracking tune. Yeah, there's some good yeah. good songs on those albums, yeah. and like really good, like maybe yeah. not production, but like mm. interesting kind of like stuff that he's never done before. Stuff that's got like proper melody and yeah, like a beat to it. And there there's some exciting songs in it. I don't, you know, I don't, I can't believe anyone in the world is diving into Saved, um, you know, uh, every day of their life. Um, but there's some really so good songs. Every grain of sound is one yeah. Of the oh my god, I love it. <laughs> in the catalogue it's it's incredible too it is it is and um so yeah it's uh i guess i I just think um it's that thing we want we want these people to be who we want them to be not not who they are Mm. and you have to accept people on their own terms and if he says yes we know he he lies about himself a lot and he he constructs this identity but also at the same time if you write something in a song or he says something about himself 
uh, and and it doesn't quite chime with who think he needs to be. We, I, for me, as you know, your classic old school lefty, um, that's a problem in my thinking. That's that's our inability to accept things that we don't want to be true. It says more about us than it does about Dylan or Lennon, you know. Mm-hmm. And and the, the marks in the book title refers to to a sociologist and then a, a literary critic who who writes about Dylan and Lennon's sense of history. And the conclusion of the book is that is that neither of them are neither of those artists are Marxist. Dylan certainly isn't. He's way too interested in individualism mm. and and in it seems to be in, in many ways kind of quite patriotic to a certain extent, even though, you know, he wrote lots of songs about the dangers of patriotism, like the God on our side and stuff. But at the same time, he's still somebody who who really values um, the American worldview and, and the American landscape very much so. And um, and Lennon, Lennon was just too kind of, although he had that, that period in the early 70s where politically he was extremely left-wing and essentially joined the Fourth International, which is almost a kind of communist cult movement um aside from that brief period he's he was way too spiritual to be a marxist so neither of them fit the marks the criteria for that ultra left historical materialism that is a definition of marxist thinking um even though i use two marxists as theorists as ways of looking at their work neither of those the artists is a isn't i conclude neither of them is really a proper marxist in that sense but for people mm. on the left, that's quite a painful thing to acknowledge because you yeah. want your heroes to reflect who you are, you know. Yeah, but I think I, I, I agree. Gone. But sorry, I, I agree. But I think that it's it's I'm kind of pleased that he's not, mm. you know, this this unhuman thing. You know, he, he it's nice that he, he is he is human. Mm. He does have different yeah. different tastes and different, you know, ideals. I think it's quite telling recently the difference between a Bob Dylan and a Joni Mitchell and a Neil Young, even though I love those artists and particularly Joni Mitchell, I think with the whole mm. Spotify thing and, mm. and the Joe Rogan, you know, mess that is that, that Spotify thing that's going on at the moment. I think, you know, Neil Young and Joni Mitchell took their music off Spotify because they believed it was the right thing to do. Dylan would never do that, not in 2022. And, you know, mm. by the time this goes out, he might have taken his entire back catalogue off yeah, of Spotify. Yeah, by the time he recorded look, it. Looks stupid. But I, I can't, yeah. unless he has, you know, unless something really wrangles him, I, I can never see him doing that because I don't think he's that type of person. I think even if someone in his team went to him and said, oh, Spotify are putting out all this misinformation about vaccines, should we take your music off? I think he'd be like, no <laughs> how much mm. money does it make me no i'm not, not going to do that and it, you know it, of course he can survive without spotify it doesn't make him that much money as mm. i'm sure you know john it's it's you know, not a money maker yeah. <laughs> mm. but, but i think he's not he's not as idealistic as someone like Joni mitchell or, or neil young mm. i just think he's just not that type of guy even though we have been led to believe um through you know whomever uh, and partly dylan himself that he was but he's, he's just not that kind of guy as a fan you listen mm. to masters of war or, or with God on our side, and it just speaks to you. It, it touches your heart. If you're interested in politics, if you, and and for both of those artists, I think they achieved incredible things as as anti-war songwriters. Mm. And for for John, for Give Peace a chance to be quoted at the United Nations this week. You know, we're we're just at a, a stage of just horror in Ukraine at the moment. Mm. And um, for a song from however many years, what is it? 50, 69, 69, you know, 53 seven, years. 60, yeah. 53 years. Um, mm. For that to be quoted at the United Nations today, and imagine to be sung, imagine it's sung at every Olympic ceremony now, and has been for about five years. It's also sung at midnight at the New Year's Eve ball drop in, in Times Square. Um, mm. For such a radical song, you know, imagine no countries and imagine no possessions and imagine no religion. No religion. It's obviously taken off some some of the American versions when it's performed on television. But mm. um, those are, uh, that's for me, that's got to be a profound achievement for any songwriter in the 20th century for that still to be relevant, sadly, today. Um, yeah. That's an incredible thing to for Lennon to have achieved, and um, I uh, I was lucky enough to play on the Imagine piano when just after George Michael bought it, and uh, oh. Louise and Andy from Sleepy were doing some recording at his studio in Highgate, and um, I just popped, I'd come back from America, I'd been living in, in LA for a while, 
I was over there staying with them and uh, shot around there. But it was in the days where you buy a disposable camera, bought a disposable mm. camera, like playing it on the piano and had a picture taken with it. And just, just it, it was one of those moments where it, it was just um, one of the most incredible days of your life. And I, I got very emotional. Uh, I was completely sober. And um, <laughs> I hugged the piano. <laughs> I had a metal button on my jacket, rather like this one. And yeah. as I hugged the piano, I put a big scratch across the top of it from the metal button. Oh, no. George, George Michael had just paid 1.4 million. Uh, uh, and it's still there today under a glass case in the Beatles Museum <laughs> in Liverpool with my scratch on, on the top. It's an elbow length in from the right hand side. Oh, did, okay. anyone, did, did anyone say anything? Yeah, the, en- the engineer was in. <laughs> George was on the way. And, um, oh, no. And I just like went white. I was like, oh, my God, I've just scratched a 1.4 million pound piano. And um, it's an upright. It's a Steinway Brown upright. It's not the grand. It's not the white grand. It's oh, okay. the upright. And um, uh, and the engineer, bless him, just said, "Look, George is stoned most of the time, so yeah. he's not he's not going to notice." Yeah. And if you look at and then Andy from Sleep said, "Actually, if you look at this piano, it's covered in scratches. It had it's got cigarette burns all over it where Lennon's left cigarettes to burn out. Yeah, uh, on the wood of the piano. So I've added to the marks that." That, uh, that John put on there uh, in well, a slightly unauthorised way. And now, well, but the comedy being, it's now under a glass case. Uh, <laughs> so nobody else can scratch it. <laughs> well, well I, I played Lady Madonna and Let It Be on the piano in Fourth Lynn Road. The, oh, the wow, piano. amazing. Unfortunately, Excellent. it's not the original piano. It was right. another piano, but I played it in Paul McCartney's childhood living room. So wow. It was quite nice. Yeah, it, it's yeah. A, it, that, that house is the, a really good, visit i recommend I've, d- I've done that tour five times in fact oh so, you know i always say if you, if you have listeners from america who are coming over now we're post pandemic book two because one's not enough uh, well it's all one now isn't it it's yeah but book book the trip twice i did the motor oh right right I went to detroit flew into detroit and and they were like why is as you do when you get in the airport like why are you here and i'm like i'm a tourist and the mm. guy was like no tourists come to Detroit. Why are you here? I said, I'm going to the Motown Museum. And I, I went, that was $8 in those days. And I went round it and got to the front again. And I said, I've got to do it again. It's yeah. incredible. And so they'll find a way, you know, they just let me through again because I paid once. And uh, yeah, it's a, lot, it's a bit like that. If you, the first um, time, the first if, time I did the John Lennon one, um, I was about 23 or 24. And when everyone was leaving, I, I did stay in John Lennon's bedroom for about a minute and say, Come on, mate. You know, send me something. Can you mm. can you send me a song? Can you just send me some vibes? Help me, mate. Come on. And then I realised that you know John Lennon was human, unfortunately. Yes, he did I, used I, to say, "I'm human." You know, I, I did the same thing. It, it, did you? It's yeah. something quite special about standing in that room. On it was own. strange. I mean, you think you think about it. Um, you know, Paul McCartney would have been in that room with him and they might have heard Heartbreak Hotel or learned the chords. Yeah. And Stuart Sutcliffe and George Harrison. And I don't know if Ring, I guess Ringo wouldn't have been there, but. There's a famous you know. picture of him with his lying on the bed with his feet up against the wall. And I just imagined that that's how he read. So I imagine, I just thought about yeah. him as, you know, 15 years old or whatever, listening to the goons, reading, reading to Lewis Carroll in that position yeah. on the bed. I was really upset when I watched Nowhere Boy that they 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 made out that Uncle George had died after drinking himself to death. I mean, sorry, we're going a bit off topic. But well, that's one of those things, that's one of those things films do, isn't it? They have to squidge together the narrative. No, I know, I know. But like, and you know, they go and record the demo the next day, and it's like, oh, why have you done that? Yeah. Ray, Ray, the Ray Charles uh, films the same. He li- he gets off the bus and bumps into this kid. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, pleased to meet you. I'm Quincy, Quincy Jones. And it's like, that oh, yeah. took 18 months, you know. But in the movie, he literally steps off the bus and bumps into Quincy Jones. So they just yeah. have to do that, I think. They um... they do, but then, you, then you're then you saying that John Lennon's uncle drank himself to death when he blatantly didn't, you know. Yeah. He liked going to the pub. But anyway, we've got a bit off topic. Sorry. The thing I was going to say, the John Lennon song I really love is Happy Christmas War Is Over. Yes. Um, now, unfortunately, in this present climate where you can go to YouTube and find that so many of your favourite melodies were nicked from other songs, unfortunately, there is a song called Stew Ball by Peter, Paul and Mary, which is, uh, sorry, John Lennon fans, cover your ears. Uh, it's a little bit similar to the melody, but I mean, he created a totally different song, but I love that because it's a sweet Christmas song and you get the best bits of Spectre. 
but then you've got war is over if you want it in the chorus and i i love that mm. it gives me a shiver every every christmas when i hear that and that's another dylan connection actually peter paul and mary oh of course yeah, yeah, blowing in the wind yeah. yeah i was, I was going to ask do, do you think that lennon was more invested as a as a protest singer than dylan was yeah definitely i think so definitely yeah. and I, I think he had he um and i think that's part of the the british kind of class tradition that, that lennon came from um and the, the sense of kind of unionization and belonging to things and mm-hmm. whereas dylan's much more in the in the book i i try and revive the notion of Dylan as, as associated with transcendentalism, which is this yeah. historical sort of literature, literary movement in America in the 1800s that he certainly would have learned about at school uh, from that great English teacher that he had. And British writers generally don't talk very much about transcendentalism because if you go to school in the UK, you learn about European history and Marxism and stuff like that. And the transcendental approach is very different and it's all about individualism and trying to be at one with nature uh, and and it's a it's a kind of a rom- romantic american reaction to industrialization um and and i, I think that's that's really important to Dell. He, he doesn't mention many transcendentalists although famously i i the multitudes quote uh, is from is from part of that tradition as well mm. um yeah. so so yeah it, 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 that's one of the few times he directly quotes writers from that tradition actually but you can see it throughout his work in his in his in in his reliance on nature and his um so many of his yeah. songs have got meteorological natural landscape metaphors it, it's yeah. it's just it's basically is and also the other thing i discovered was dylan just seems to not get on very well with technology and songs so loads of his songs about cars are about car crashes and things being broken down and rusty and hard Whereas, traveling and stuff yeah. yeah and hard traveling on a, and you look at his yeah. artwork it's all like a dark and overcast road or railroad tracks going off in you know into the sunset but in a kind of a quite a quite a scary way and um yeah iron and steel for dylan i think because of his connections obviously with hibbing is the iron uh, range yeah. yeah, it's 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 a it's a challenging set of metaphors for him, and uh, whereas nature is is a more redemptive thing and a more meaningful thing. There's one famous Dylan quote where he says, "I don't believe in nature," but actually, that you, you extend that quote out, and he's really talking about decay and death. But it, um, sorry to interrupt, it wasn't a natural process. It wasn't. I don't believe in nature. No, it wasn't. that's the only thing John Lennon didn't. <laughs> Mentioning God, sorry. To yeah, I don't believe in that. Yeah. Can I just say one thing uh, again? I love this in the book. Yeah, the amount of references to um, yeah nature, and I've got mountains, valleys, forests, oceans, and then all the song names: blowing in the wind, hard rain's going to fall, tempest, idiot wind, buckets of rain, hurricane, and about probably about fifty other ones. Yeah, there's lo- there's loads and loads, and his lyrics and his very Quite first amazing. Song, radio show was about weather, and the first song was about rain. You know, that's a great, yeah, great episode. And you can tell he, he is obsessed with with weather, which seems, you know, well, I think if you, live in the, if you live in the Midwest, there's a famous saying, if you live, I had a partner from Minnesota and, you know, I, I went there to, to visit a family and, and um, they, there's, you know, that famous saying, if you don't like the weather, stick around. Uh, mm. You get four seasons in one day over there. Mm. And, um, and he, he, I think that, so I think weather's and landscapes a big, a big part of his life. And if you get the guy in the Midwest and you realize just how huge it is and how important the countryside is and how how tied into nature people are. And then to have that massive iron range, iron ore pit, surface mining pit, the biggest one in the world at the time, where all the steel that built New York and built the cars and all that was dragged out of the ground from around literally around his house underneath Hibbing. They had to move Hibbing to get the iron ore underneath it. Incredible. Um, you know that i think that had a pretty profound effect on him and even from his his first albums there's a poem about it and in the sleeve notes of of uh, the one that the follow-up to free reeling um times are changing and uh yeah i think that's a pretty profound element and i think we kind of miss out on that a little bit if if we're from the uk we we're not fully aware of that geographical context only only in the last 10 years writers have started to take a take account of it I, i've never been to hibbing have you ever uh, been to hibbing ben or 
No, I mean, you know, I inevitably in some sort of pathetic little pilgrimage will probably end yeah. up going. But um, it's mm. interesting because he, he never, he sort of hints at his his youth and, and growing up in, you know, in Minnesota. And I, I, and, and when you do get, because he never, he hardly ever names it in songs, but when, when you do get him naming it, he does it on the, on the Planet Waves album. And he does it at the end of a song called Went to See the Gypsy, which is on mm. um, New Morning. And it, it, that song I kind of find fascinating because a lot of people have said it's about him meeting Elvis, which apparently never actually happened. And this is sort of like an imagined meeting. But at the end, he talks about looking over this small Minnesota town, which is obviously, you know, alluding to him growing up and and it's kind of like for me it feels a little bit like he is looking back at at that place that really you know is, is still in his heart and he still carries around with him despite the fact he's you know in this in the song he describes going to this grand hotel and seeing this gypsy or the you know maybe it is elvis i don't know but you know living in this showbiz world and then looking out and seeing this town so i think it it's kind of inbuilt within him and, and it, it comes out every now and then. You sort of get a glimpse of it every now and then, that kind of fascinating mm. youth. And, and it, as you say, it comes out in sort of the weather and it, and it comes out in, in you know, references to, to ironworks or whatever. Um, so I do find that quite fascinating because he seems quite guarded about that, but it does tend to sort of appear when he gets, when he lets his guard down, should we say. I'd love to go. I'd love to make the trip, much like, much like the, the trip to Liverpool. I'd, I'd... I don't know. I just I feel those towns are so atmospheric, and certainly with the the Iron Range has become kind of um, a museum in its own right now. I think they call it the Grand Canyon of the North because uh, mm. it's just this massive man-made hole in that it scraped out of nowhere to get all the iron ore out, and literally abuts the town. Like the the town roads just run off into the into the into the canyon there, and some of the some of the mapping around it is fascinating to see. Um, yeah. It's quite hard for us to kind of get that impression because we're we're so like you know our country's so small yeah. compared to there. It's like it's another world for us. I don't think we can quite comprehend it as, as English people. Yeah, the vastness of the areas. Yeah, I don't think we can. Yeah, the, and I, I, I often wonder if if you take someone there and, and you get to his childhood home and it's on Bob Dylan Drive. If you think, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe that's where he got the name from. You know? <laughs> it's like all the all all the all the American Civil War battles happened in in uh, in parks. I don't know, you know, <laughs> state state country parks. What, uh... But Ben, what year did he go back then? You said he went back briefly. What, oh, what um, year was that? It wasn't until let me try and remember. It wasn't until a long time later. I think his his dad had just died, so um, it maybe was when he was in Woodstock, so maybe late sixties. I think that could be could be completely wrong. But um, there's an account. Oh, I, I think it's the funeral of his recently. dad. Oh, I thought you were talking about yeah. recently. Oh, right, right, right. No, he's yeah, his childhood home because he, he he left there. Um, it's just it's it's not even you know. I looked it up on Google Maps. It's it's looks exactly the same when he left it um, well he had a reunion kind of didn't he in 68 there's a picture of him didn't they have a school reunion in 68 yes yeah, yeah. so that it was it was after that yeah 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 right interesting um we're gonna have to scoot through uh, history and then spirituality just like small topics you know um <laughs> Well, kind of the, the focus of the book pulls mm. out from one subject, the 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 anti-war protest songs, because I didn't feel it, it was fair to compare their view of protest in relation to a domestic politics issue like the civil rights movement or whatever, which Dylan's yeah. obviously written brilliantly, amazingly on, as we've said. But um, yeah, then it moves out to the general concept of the past and the heritage, which kind of we've spoken about, yeah, talk, talking about already, really, and then moves out to the great existential question of. What does it actually mean to be a human being? Well, can we just talk about um, John Lennon and history and this thing about the empire? Mm. Um, he said an interesting thing. The Whig, W-H-I-G, that's the party, wasn't it? Interpretation of history. The British Empire is a positive global force that inspired and motivated economic and social progress worldwide. Now, of course, all kinds of stuff has come out now that there was a, a dark side, <laughs> to put it very bluntly, mm. to put it very lightly. And... Uh, you made a comparison that I make as well, the, the US version of Manifest Destiny, mm. even though they, they'll probably deny they have an empire. I would say they do. But um, but what was so what was John Lennon's relationship with the empire? So it's I think it's just it's ingrained in everything he does. Uh, when you mm. when you were at school in the in the 50s and in the United Kingdom, you, you couldn't help but, you know, there'd be a map on the wall. With all the pink bits where the British Empire was, you were told the sun never set on the British Empire. And then 
gradually the uh, in the in the post-war period the british british empire dissolved and the, the great irony being just as the beatles conquered the world those years when beatlemania took over the uk and then europe and uh, and france and then the united states each one of those years 10 or 15 countries were were disestablishing themselves from the british empire mm-hmm. so we went from being this i want to use the word trade but it was it, there was goods involved but it wasn't necessarily fair trade um mm-hmm. trade and conquest uh we went from that to uh, to this kind of cultural exchange where the so i think it's kind of cool that the beatles took over what had been the british empire and all the exploitation involved in that to more of a a cultural thing that that only they really could have been in a position to do you know they they're they're, as we're retreating from the world politically and economically and militarily they're sending all these songs around the world and because we've been involved with india you know they're, they're meeting this 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 kind of continent culturally initially quite clumsily in things like help the the film and then later on in a slightly more sophisticated way through george harrison's genuine attempt to to master some of the instrumentation and and the the musical technologies from that continent and uh, and of course Mm. the religious element as well that he got involved in as, as bob did as well and um both of them i think did a lot to help the early days of kind of integration and and cultural the great cultural melting pot that you, that united kingdom has become i think the beatles were in a unique position to help foster that in a positive way and that's mm. something else that they did that that they really need a bit more credit for potentially um you know compare them with eric clapton's stance say at the time it's uh mm. worlds apart and now they don't, they don't get a lot of credit for that so. <laughs> yeah but and, and especially given the abuse that John and Yoko got, you know, just naked racism. Oh, absolutely. In her yeah. direction. They were, There's, you know, from I don't know much about the Beatles at all, but you know what a prog- uh, you know what a progressive band. I mm. mean, mm. just the things they they did. You know, I think it, it's it's strange to think about it now because we 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 know it so well. But for them to to incorporate Indian music in their in their music is such a you know forward thinking and different thing to do you know mm. people wouldn't do that now because you know they just they wouldn't think no, but whole tracks on sergeant peppers you know yeah are and revolver style. as well and revolver yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 th- there's a huge debate about cultural appropriation and i had to include some of that in the book to you know because mm. to at least acknowledge it but you, at the same time all of that notwithstanding george i think george was being very genuine you know and he, he bought the back to the dancer manor that's now stands outside of watford for the harry krishna movement you know he yep. bought that building he set them up in this country for a while yeah. they had all kinds of things going on you know several several premises and a, a kind of a mini university and a publishing house harrison did that and lennon mm. put them up when they first came over because he had the space in his in, in the grounds of his house to accommodate yeah, there's actually a recording of John Yoko George and uh, Swami Prabhupada. Yes. He has a longer name, but I'll just say Swami Prabhupada. <laughs> That's a short name uh, of them in discussing sort of spirituality, mm. isn't there? And, Which um, is now a book published by uh, mm. Hare Krishna Foundation, the Publishing Foundation. Yeah. Which, um, you know, so uh, that I think it was. It, this wasn't appropriation. It was. It was a genuine attempt. At, it, it may or may not have been appropriation. It's not my place to say, but from their side, at least, it was a genuine attempt to make a more of an exchange or an accommodation rather than appropriation. And you can see the difference in help, which is really clumsy and and pretty insulting in some ways to various forms of culture that it that it encounters as as Brits were in the in the mid sixties to to where the Beatles then took it. Um, certainly, as I said, when you compare it with other artists, it's uh, it's quite profound, really. They didn't have to do it that way. It yeah. felt like they were really invested into it, didn't mm. it? it? felt like, and and oh, it was a it was yeah. born out of a real kind of interest or passion. I, I guess it's similar to kind of it's similar to you know George Harrison, yeah. um, it, it being interested in Dylan. You know, it's the same. Yeah. He was interested in different types of music, and I, I guess he incorporated them in into him his music. And John and Yoko did a lot to try and publicize some of the some of the issues that were going on at the time that were less well known about, not just the Vietnam War. You know, the things that things that were happening in Biafra at the time. Yes, if it hadn't have been for them 
talking about it as much as they did. I don't think that many people would really have known about it. I mean, it's largely forgotten about today. And some of the fate of the Pacific Islanders that they spoke about and, and some of the things that were going on in the Caribbean at the time, their, their involvement with some of the campaigners around that, like Mike, mm. Michael X, who's like the British version of Malcolm X and stuff. They, they, um, they did huge amounts of stuff that could have been potentially quite damaging but they just didn't care because they wanted to do what was right and a lot a lot of that was about the global context of 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 cultures and our uh, Brit, Brit, britain's relationship to the world and they, they were trying very hard i think to be progressive and to do that in a responsible and kind of caring and genuine way so it wasn't appropriation and it, it was it was it was a more kind of um even-handed approach so i mean let me say john and yoko i think were completely sincere and i've been lucky enough on this podcast to talk to people that knew them and you know you could say that if they're friends they're probably going to give you the more positive spin but you know it took a lot of risks i mean Mm. it's not really the place to talk about his his murder now but i mean maybe we could talk about another time john if you want Mm. i have very strong views on that um but yeah i think they were sincere when they went to india I mean, every, yes. everyone there will tell you, you know, John Lennon in his, again, I'd, I'd say a bit of a similarity with Dylan. Maybe you could tell me better, like they do go full bore into something and maybe it doesn't last that long. You know, John Wiener in that Come Together book mm. talks about John Lennon it was was this for 18 months, then this for 18 months. But it wasn't that he was completely changing. He was just evolving. So yeah, 69, I- 69 was a year of peace. 1970 was primal therapy. So he's moving more inward. Then he gets into new left. But I think there's a psychological thing going on there because he, 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 he separated from his dad at an early age and then his stepdad died. And, yeah. and I think there was a lifelong search for a father figure. So moving from those one organisation to another over that period is, yeah. is, you know, you can imagine Prabhupada being a father figure and then, you know, going Yanov. out to India and, and Yanov and, and then the politic, political figures and, you know, you, you, we, we, as someone on the left, you know, you can look at a figure like M- Marx's writing in the in the nineteen hundred was so prophetic and so it's so, you know, the Communist Manifesto is an incredible document to read. And as a student, I was like, wow, this is so inspiring. And you can imagine someone like Lenin reading that kind of literature and getting involved with the Fourth International and, and the people around that. And um, you know, despite the fact that it's slightly problematic and communism's caused a lot of issues as well, and um, you know that he's looking for solutions and i think we have a need for that parenting it personally i suspect it's an evolutionary need um that we have a we 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 have a need for guidance and and uh the 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 work that influenced the final chapter which is the evolutionary psychology and the analysis of their faith Mm. andy thompson uses a metaphor of a child reaching up for their parent and he goes to observes people worshiping at a church and they're holding their hands up like that to God as they're singing. Mm. And he said it, it, one of the things that kind of struck him quite early on about that relationship was this need for guidance and looking up and lift, you know, lift me up Lord, holding their hands up and looking up to the sky. That's very much like he had a toddler at the time and he, the, the child would, would stand underneath him and make exactly the same gesture. And if you imagine that we are physically quite weak mammals who, who on our own with, uh, couldn't possibly exist outside in the world around us without very strong parenting and without very strong bonding mechanisms socially. Because mm. individually, we're nothing. But mm. we have this incredible frontal cortex that means we can communicate with each other and read faces and develop language and all this kind of sophisticated means of coming together so that we're more powerful in groups. And parenting... And other forms of bonding are, are a big part of that. You know, humans stay children much longer than most of the mammals do. Yes. Um, you know, and I think that's so. With Lennon, Lennon's journey, in the, I think, is in the sort of old school, fr- clumsily Freudian sense, search for a search for a dad. And that, there's that incredibly poignant scene where his dad leaves to go to New Zealand, and he's five or six, and on the on the mm. pier at Blackpool or wherever is, and they, his parents force him to make a decision and he walks off with his dad and then turns around and runs to his mum, you know. Yeah. That kind of thing's going to stay with you. And indeed, 
you know, later on he, w- he would write Mother and do that the Yanov Primal Scream on record, which I play to students today, and they're like, "Oh my God, what is?" Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's by far my that's my favorite John Lennon album by far. Mm. I mean, there weren't that many, of course, but yeah, I love it. There's quite all a right. good book on all this. Uh, I mentioned it in my book. It's been largely forgotten, but it's uh, I'm showing holding up a copy with the the Beatles with Lacan. Lacan was a Freudian French. Ooh. Uh, I've never even heard rare. of it. I, I've got, I, I've got a, I scanned it because it's quite rare. So I'll, I'll send you the PDF. Oh, this is Henry W. Sullivan, who, who was um, a writer in the 1980s, and he goes through. Uh, he's a psychologist, and he does a Freudian analysis of the Beatles, which is where I got a lot of that from. Oh, fantastic! All right, um, I'm going to have to reluctantly bring this to a close, but we can go for a bit longer if you're right. And um, I'm fine. Yeah, I yeah. wonder if. And Ben, yeah, I wonder if the enduring appeal really it does come down to this thing of uh, consciousness and the human condition. And as we've said, you know, uh, one of you said earlier about if you look at Don't Look Back, the film, and there's there's some quite comical mm. bits with journalists saying, you know, Bob, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But they obviously did have some, I don't know, s- special insight or. They obviously had some gift, and we don't quite know where that came from. I suspect with John Lennon, a lot of it is something as mundane as reading mm. hundreds of books and spending every day. And he's inspired me so much because I wasn't really much of a reader when I was young. I mean, I read kids' books. But he, his example, I mean, I read every day now, read something every day. So either of you I got think, anything to say about I that? I think they both knew how to give good interview. Right. And, you know, Dylan just came out with amazing quotes at just the right time. And right. Lennon very much so as well, you know, sometimes to his cost, famously. Mm. And, um, and and when you think about the me- the role of the media in, in uplifting public figures and the role of stardom in replacing our old gods, you know, we use all this language, you know, about someone being iconic or whatever. I mean, they're all religious words. And the science has kind of reduced the God of the gaps to smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, we've got a mathematical model of the universe going back to the first one three hundred thousandths of a second or whatever. We can we can pretty much explain the whole Big Bang and everything and and then even how it might have come out of nothing, you know. And we can see we can see deep into what, what molecules consist of and how they work and mm. um and further and further out into space, you know, so that those grander questions, it seems one might argue are kind of being answered, but our psychological Mm. need for explanation and purpose is still there. So again, in the sixties, someone like Dylan or Lennon comes along and they seem to have all the answers. We just transfer our faith in one thing into our faith in something else. And, I think that's a process we're all vulnerable to, which is why I think it's really important to be aware of it because I think it's happening all the time. You know, I'm fascinated that two figures who are such independent and creative thinkers both got involved in thought reform organisations in different ways or another. So if they're vulnerable to it, we all are. Mm. It's made me reassess my own politics a little bit and think about that and the importance of, of protecting certain freedoms as an artist it's like because because there are some fundamental things that that we've got to look after in terms of the ability to express yourself and say things Mm. that 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 might be challenging and um, i worry that if we lose those in in the name of higher goals you know i don't know where dylan or lennon would stand on that but i think their story kind of tells you that if they can be vulnerable to it you know, the, the, the political movement that John got involved with in 1972 was well-meaning, absolutely, and one that I've supported for most of my life, but mm. also believed in the violent overthrow of the state and imprisonment of anybody who disagreed with them and execution right. of them, ultimately, you know. Uh, wow. So I'm not sure about, you know, that's where it always goes. Um I think, I think for the proletariat, what, what you know, how do you escape that once it's established? How does it just not become a gangster regime, as we've seen now in in Russia and you, you know, both of the, Russia and Ukraine have both have their issues around democracy, mm. and um, that's the legacy. That's where that 
comes from that kind of legacy of the the liberal democracy that it's so easy to to pick holes in mm. you know that allows still has allows that kind of expression and, and and anything can happen at an election and you might disagree with boris johnson or trump as i'm sure we both do profoundly they they'll get voted out and, and and then they've got to go as they as trump found out to his cost you know mm. much as he wanted otherwise those checks and balances are really important i think and um yeah so it's it's the, our vulnerability to to group think is profound and it seems like the more certain we are that we're escaping it the more dangerous it might be and that's possibly the lesson from them i don't know wow. that's an evolutionary thing it's evolutionary psychology the need to belong and the need to other others and i think when when bob and and lennon Dylan and Lennon were writing in the 60s that the others were, you know, it was clearly people from other countries and other things. And now sometimes it's pe people that just think differently or whatever. And it's a tricky one. It's a difficult one. I don't, I don't know what the answer is and I don't, wouldn't pretend to have it. Mm. But I think it's, that's in some way to me, that's kind of the, the light that their work shines on us a little bit is if they're vulnerable to that kind of in-group thinking, then then who who isn't? I think they're both maybe, I'd definitely say John Lennon was an, what they call an unreliable narrator. Mm. In mm. that, you know, if you ask him about something and then you ask him a year later, he might have completely different views, but the work is there. And I think mm. you more or less conclude that in your book. Um, and Dylan too, I think they're both, sure. both like that. And, and that's, that's the, the, the joy of the multitudes element. It's like, yes, I can be wrong. I can have yeah. a different opinion. And I think that's a good thing for an artist to change their mind as they go through life if they don't it's like you know i mean no offense to billy bragg but it's like <laughs> it's yeah, too, so predictable isn't it <laughs> yeah 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 it's almost I'm like big big billy bragg fan don't get me wrong oh you know? yeah yeah but it's almost like well you would say that billy <laughs> like, yeah. it always feels like that um yeah. no I, I i completely agree with what with what john was saying especially about you know um about not you know they're they're almost kind of reflect that they are our icons and i mean that in in the true sense and mm. it's it's almost you know we, we we i think in the 60s people looked to them like i said earlier for answers and that's quite difficult for one person to take but i think you know they were probably good people to to look at because i think they they were both more intelligent than your average person and they both read more than your average person and i i think that they certainly gave the impression whether this was true or not i don't know but they certainly gave the impression that they saw the world in a in a in a better way than some other people mm. and i think that's mm. kind of stuck with dylan a little bit and this this could be him either going crazy or it could be him seeing how the world works and he you know he talks a lot in interviews or has done in the past about this this idea of transfiguration or transformations he calls it mm. which is is I think nine times out of ten he's just playing with the interviewer and just because he's bored and he just loves a little bit of misdirection. Mm. But I also really feel like he he does he 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 thinks that he sees the world in a in a slightly higher way to, than some other people, mm. and maybe he does. And I think you know he 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 feels like a a guy that that is more awake to things than than maybe your average person. And I think yeah. it, it's it, that's what's brought on him kind of constantly questioning everything and, and that's what he does quite well and, and if you look at his work and, and regardless of of which side he's singing from whether you think it's the left or the right i think he he's always had a mistrust of authority and that's always coming through in, yes. in so many of his songs and i i think that's born out of that and uh, you know whether or not he consciously decided that that was going to be something he 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 he's doing or he wants to do in his career i think that's probably a good thing because we do need those people to to do that it's um, a questioning on, on yeah. behalf of us yeah, yeah it's and, a questioning yeah absolutely and it's, it, that's been one of the few constants in his career you know right through the religious period right through to you know the the stuff he's putting out still now in this era mm -hmm. um he, he's still questioning authority and i think that's that's quite important but but not in you know like you said about billy bragg not in the kind of billy bragg way and I, i'm set in my ways and this mm. is again i like billy bragg but but you know it's it's important to kind of you know question it in different ways mm -hmm. it, there, there was an interesting a sort of a dilemma with the book title i went with um dylan lennon marks and god because it just seemed like a good 
band and um fab four yeah. prog, prog rock band, the fab yeah. four yeah, yeah. and um, but, but really it should be dylan <laughs> lennon marx and darwin yeah it's it's a, it's a darwinian approach it's it's evolutionary yeah. psychology to explain yeah. their belief systems and um and obviously lennon wrote you know sang famously uh, the, god the song god that mm. didn't believe and was imagine no religion and there's been a bit of kickback amongst british readers on various discussion groups because i think they they don't want to believe that lennon was spiritual or a believer quote unquote but he clearly yeah. was his search of his whole life was 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 a belief system that he could follow so it's yeah. it may not be god but it's it it follows the same psychological pathways that dylan's religious experience does and that's the point so it really should have been Dylan Lennon, Marx and Darwin, and probably would have sold a few more copies in the UK. Not that it's not a problem at the moment. Yeah. In the, I think sale, it might help sales in this country. However, in America, because it's precisely because it's called Dylan Lennon, Marx and God, it's done really well. It was number one in the new music book on Amazon um, <laughs> because it's got God in the title. So, yeah. you know, it's a it's a win, 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 lose scenario. It's it's a, one of those things that's um unforeseen consequences of 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 that title decision down the line. But yeah, I mean uh, God God's on your side, isn't he in America? Yeah, he is, yeah. certainly in, in that circumstance. But the uh, every chapter I try and find something new to say. And and the the I suppose the big revelation in that one is that during the 1970s, both of them uh we we having gone through that period of I think in the 60s they were they were very important public figures because they were both so bright and so good at speaking, speaking out publicly. Mm. And then in the seventies, you know, science started moving along. We started finding real explanations for things. One of mm. which was Lucy, which was the, the first quote unquote missing link between mm. us and, and our common ancestors in, in chimpanzees. And so that was a huge discussion point in the media in the seventies and both Dylan and Lennon publicly denied human evolution from monkeys quite vociferously wow. in the late 70s which i thought was um an interesting coincidence not least because lucy is named after lucy in the sky with diamonds after one of lennon's characters yeah so sure. for them to have both gone on record i mean lennon goes you know we didn't come from monkeys so i don't believe that for a minute it's just absolute nonsense uh, and yet the, the 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 skeleton that's been discovered in the rift valley, rift valley uh, is named after one of his songs. So <laughs> delicious irony there. That came from his son, actually, didn't it, Julian? We have actually yes. seen, yes. we know that for a fact because we've seen the, the picture. We now know, yeah, we've now yes. seen the picture. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. But it's just, um, it's one of those great little ironies that that uh, I, made me smile when I, when I, when I, when I realised that it was, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing that they, they were both had periods of such certainty about that. And I, I mean, I don't think Dylan's still a young earth creationist. I think he's still probably a believer in some form of Christianity. There's quite a tradition mm. of um, people who are culturally Jewish. There's that sort of Jews for Jesus movement in mm. America that's, that's not very big, but I think probably is probably aligned with where Dylan is in terms of his ideas about spirituality today. Yeah, they were. Lots I think of, they were. Yeah, lots of his albums still today have have spiritual tropes on them. Yeah, the, yeah. the Jews for Jesus movement, I think, were were kind of not closely linked with him during mm. his his early religious days, but they they certainly made a play to get him involved, mm. and that's mm. no real surprise. But yeah, I think he's I think he's always had religion in in his work from the very start to even to now. But it was it was just more overt for a while, <laughs> um, and it, it, he he swung to one particular area, and now you know, like we were saying earlier, with his political beliefs i think he's just swung to another area and and again again like the politics stuff i think it's still there but it's just it's much more buried for you know lots of different reasons and they they, they mm. both uh, the interesting comparison there is that they both read wacky history books um that mm. basically foretold the future uh, dylan's dylan's was the late great planet earth by hal hal lindsley which was a massive bestseller in the 70s and if you'd have read mm. that and believed it you'd have joined the vineyard church too because you generally thought the world was coming to an end mm. and um dylan's was the passover plot in the six massive you know pseudo historical oh john lennon's biblical. One, yeah. uh, sorry yeah. lennon's was the passover plot yeah his quote about the beatles being bigger than jesus is just straight out of the passover plot that whole him sort of 
denigrating the um the the disciples the disciples were thick and ordinary that's basically Hugh Shanfield's the the Passover plot and um I kind of suspect yeah. it's a bit like the crutches wheelchair thing that you spoke about in the last podcast where mm. we think Dylan probably saw a picture of Lenny in his wheelchair and then put that in the song mm. um, you in your wheelchair I suspect that Hugh Shone when when in that interview um with the with the Maureen, Maureen Cleave, the Evening Standard mm. Journalist, she says he has an extensive reading on on biblical history. I reckon that's basically just the Passover plot. <laughs> she saw a copy of that and went, "He's he's extensive, extensive reading." reading yeah. It's just one book, pseudo historical <laughs> yeah. Old Testament nonsense, and mm. but it's weird that because of that, the Beatles retreated to the studio and Sergeant Pepper's came out of it and yeah, uh, turned his, turned musical history around, and then because of the late great planet Earth. Dylan went into his his whole kind of Christian period. Both they've got to be two of the most influential books in the story of popular music. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> you would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah. I've just completely discredited pseudo history, <laughs> historical nonsense. Um, yeah. But, but both changed popular music history irrevocably. But that's why I, I love the fact that, and and thank God that you know they did grow up in the sixties where we haven't got instagram and mm. you know youtube because i think now can you imagine if one of them just got drunk or high and then went on instagram and started talking live the whole persona and mystique would fall apart because they've yeah. been babbling on about some conspiracy theory but yeah. you know in the 60s and 70s it, it just it was just became a part of them and they used it in their art so i think yeah. we're kind of lucky in a way that they did exist mm. in in that time so we I you think know, so. The, the mystique is still there because they are two very mysterious artists and it's very difficult to control. Even then, I think it was tough to control your public image. And it, you can see it go wrong in so many ways now Now that we're in that sort of hyper-vigilant social media world. So, yeah, they. Um, I think I think they're both... They're both really good at what they do, and that's why they're, they were where they got to be. And um, I think that's to be celebrated, really. And the mystique is still there. I mean, we just did a show about 1969 and I loaded it with audio clips because I was just mm. loving it. Some of the stuff John Lennon was saying, yeah. Mm. Some people say, oh, it's silly and everything. I don't think so. I actually think that there's, uh, oh, this is really going to psychology, but I think there's a resistance to change that comes over people and that when someone does, does actually try and change it, mm. they, 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 they react against it. It's weird. I mean, it's too much to go into now, but. Um, yeah, we have, we have, but I think they're inherent they're inherent and they're they're the argument that i kind of draw on in the final chapter is that these things are, are evolved and um yes it's a tricky one because again it's it's it, it, i feel it's like it's worth having though because it's like we, we live in a world of constructivism everything's socially constructed which is one way of looking at the world but then in other ways it's like well hang on a minute maybe some of this is biological and even even our psychology if you're saying our psychology isn't connected to our biology then what is it connected to because that is what religion says and if you if you're coming from a more of a if you're coming from that world fair enough but if you're coming from a more of a okay we can kind of explain stuff now then, 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 mind and body are, are, are have an important relationship, and um, so understanding some of those mechanisms and how they manifest in pop song, which which does deal with those basic human urges. I have yeah. just done another book chapter on Sugar Sugar by the Archies, speaking of nineteen sixty nine, mm. and um, it's it's like a completely manufactured song about sweetness, right? It's literally a cartoon band who never existed, yeah. who 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 never toured, never did an interview, great pop song, goes to number one around the world, brilliant. And it's about as it's about as trivial as it could be. It's about sweetness, and it's got the chorus, 70 of the 84 bars are the chorus, mm. it's repeated ad, ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. But it, that, that link between sweetness and romantic love and desire is quite profound because everyone alive today is part of an un unbroken chain of life that goes all the way back to the first reproducing single cell animals. So that's reproduction. And that's also uh, nourishment. 
without those two things we none of us would be here so sugar sugar is a metaphor for the for the human condition quite wow possibly. i never thought when, when that's we started a good this, argument you'd, you'd be saying yeah. that <laughs> that's, that's a good argument we'd so as, as difficult as difficult as as evolutionary psychology is you know we, we we accept it in our taste for food we know that we know that there's Mars bars at the checkout because we've got a weakness for sugar because we evolved mm. in a calorie scarce environment and it mm. hits all our reward systems. And we know that that's what romantic attraction does as well. And, and, and with the, with the chapter on religion, uh, I was looking at some work that basically applies evolutionary psychology to, to religious thought. So mm. that's why that comes in there. But I, I think pop music is important like that. It's quite, it's dealing with basic human urges, but at the same time, that they're, they're, they're quite profound, you know. Um, yeah, it's a mixture of shallow and deep, I'd say. Yeah. Pop music. And, yeah. I, and I think, yeah, the conclusion perhaps we could reach with John Lennon and Bob Dylan, they had this depth and they had these insights, but then they've got amazing songs. Mm. So let, let, me, let me finish with this. Uh, it feels like with John Lennon, the two songs that probably are the most celebrated maybe i'll give peace a chance and imagine certainly in terms of like crowds getting together and singing them but let's ask ben um i hate to end on a morbid note but bob is not going to be around forever i mean in the next few years we're going to lose mccartney yoko ono bob dylan i'm afraid to say a few others but let's say that bob didn't make any more albums and i hope he does oh there's my phone turn your phones off kids sorry about that uh, what would what do you think is what's what's Dylan's most celebrated song and and what do you think they'll be singing after he's gone? It's hard, isn't it? Because I think you know when we've had others pass, certain songs emerge that you were maybe not expecting. Although having said that, with mm. Bowie, it was it was Heroes, wasn't it? And mm. yes, um, yeah. So I, I think it's probably a two horse race between Blowing in the Wind and Like a Rolling Stone, and I think Like a Rolling Stone might emerge as the one because it was i think when you know purely from a and this is my broadcast brain talking now purely mm. from a kind of um uh obit uh, kind of uh, mode i think that it, it was so big when he went electric it was such a big cu cultural thing i think that's the thing that people will say when dylan passes and that's the song that's you know the electric song not his mm. first electric song but certainly his most famous electric song um so i think that might emerge as the one song that kind of gets branded around and more than maybe blowing in the wind even though that's probably culturally slightly more important um and also you know again just from a purely technical point of view i think like a rolling stone sounds pretty good on the radio and pretty good on the tv so that would be the song that is he's defined by for all those reasons and you know fine it's sometimes uh, an artist or a band's best song isn't their big hit and you know, John, I don't know how you feel about Sleeper, but I, I'm sure as a band, you had songs that you loved that weren't singles or weren't big hits. But with Like a Rolling Stone and Dylan, I think it's 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 a really good song. It's, I don't think it's his best song, but I think it's a really good song for him to be defined by. So I'm, I'm kind of happy if it's that. Um, I'd go with that one too, actually. That one on yeah. Rainy, Day, Rainy Day Women. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine if that was his... Uh... That would be hilarious. But you know what? That was That's that's probably... Well, it, it, they both went to number two in the chart in the Billboard right. Hot 100. So it, yeah. it, it, it it's yeah. probably technically his biggest single, yeah. along with Like a Rolling Stone. Yeah, they were uh, the biggest singles, yeah. Which is... Yeah troubling i mean so I, I bet he likes that though it's because you know he likes a bit of a weird song doesn't he mm. so yeah if it is that then i think he'll he'll, he'll find it funny i have a theory I, that the times are changing has kind of fallen out of fashion because it's just too much because i the think blowing in the wind changing too much yeah i think that they're, yeah. they're almost too idealistic these days and i think yeah. that, I, I, to be fair i don't think they dated badly in any way but i think mm. i think like a rolling stone still sounds pretty fresh as does subterranean homesick blues but i think yeah. subterranean yeah. homesick blues is is just a little bit too weird maybe I think um, it's fantastic. oh it's an amazing song i think I it's, it's it. better than like a rolling stone for me in terms of a song but i, I think like a rolling stone is probably more of a more of a crowd pleaser because it does have that big chorus um oh I, 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 I saw him live in in hyde park and um for an audience that was pretty disinterested in, in what was going on on stage, you know, it is Dylan's show after all. And, and the big Dylan show, you know, you usually get people who are half interested, um, which I, I understand why. Um, was, but that was the one sorry, song where everyone in the audience sang along. 
Um, Once they and, worked and, out what he was singing. Yeah, yeah. A, a good yeah. two minutes in. <laughs> when he, when he, and he literally oh, had wait. to lead them to the chorus. No, what, what, <laughs> once they got their head around the fact that it was a dub reggae version, yeah. then they were they were right. Do you know what? I really I really like the version. It was him. It was him playing the piano as he does these days. Um, and it was a really nice kind of. It was. It sounded like a modern version of it. It sounded a little bit like it had been produced by. Um, forgive me, because I'm always mentioning this producer called Daniel Lanois, who worked with Dylan on a couple of oh, albums. Brilliant. I think I think yeah. he's great. Um, but it sounded a little bit like he'd produced it because it was quite spacious, loose uh, in terms of its sonics. Um, and and I loved it. But yeah, it, it it had been going for two minutes, and then when it came to the chorus, everyone was like, "How does it feel?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was the only time it happened. Um, in, in the entire hour and a half he was on stage or whatever. So I think it probably will be like a Rolling Stone, yeah. I've seen him once in Melbourne in 2001, and he was a bit sly, just to prove that he, he is aware of the audience. Um, he played my, my favourite set of lyrics of any song in the history of... Sorry, John. <laughs> was uh, uh, It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding. Mm, yeah. I, think, I think there's enough in that song that you could... You could just spend six months just studying that. But he did that one and everyone uh, cheered when he got to the president of the United States must mm. have to stand naked. Uh, that was George Bush at that time. You pretty much work it to almost any president, I think. <laughs> but there was the middle of one song. He got to it and then he played uh, Walsy Matilda because <laughs> we were in Melbourne. He, he played that. He worked it into the song, which I thought was fantastic. Um, so he's aware he, of his audience. That yeah, I mean, you know, we could have, we, we maybe should have touched on it earlier when talking about the sort of person he is, but his live performances, I think, sums up the sort of person he is. And like you said, John, he's quite individualistic in the fact he just does kind of whatever the hell he wants to do. Yeah. Um, but actually, it's interesting, post-pandemic, he's played it a little bit more middle of the road on stage. He's still, like, changing songs almost beyond all recognition, wow. um, which is, you know, a very Dylan thing to do. But he is doing some uh, songs in a kind of slightly more more traditional way in terms of how they sound on the record and also he's really speaking to the audience much much more which is quite interesting um so i, I don't know if that's changed anything maybe post pandemic he felt that you know his time's running out maybe and and he wants to enjoy those shows a bit more i think he's thinking about legacy a little bit which I, which I think is natural i think all those mm. artists are to a certain extent and mm. that's also um I, sp I spoke to a music industry lawyer friend about the number of people that are selling off their mm. back catalog and um he said that because that happened I, I negotiated the rights to use the lyrics for 18 songs in the book and uh, just during that process i've got the deal with i spoke to dylan's publisher and got the deal and everything got contract with his signature on it which i was like oh my god that's amazing wow. and then he sold his cop and then he sold his uh copyright to universal and and i'd got a very good deal on it um you know a few hundred quid to use the songs which was very good nowhere near that from it was never going to happen with yoko so didn't bother um and then he sold it to universal for 350 million quid so i had to go and speak to a lawyer and they were like yeah universal probably going to want at least 10 times that and um and uh, but fortunately the the publishing company the the, the contract was valid with the with the previous publishing company his because it, 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 it all been signed and carried off it just hadn't cashed the check at that time um and uh I, I i think that's all about legacy and the fact is also sold is is written uh his recordings on as well and other artists are doing it and and people have seen what happened to bob marley's estate after he died which is it just disappeared in in legal wrangling so sell off your estate apportion it done and i, I think, think legacy is a big thing at that for those people you might be able to answer this, John, but uh, is it kind of literally that he just doesn't want his kids to squabble over it? So if you can divide up money better than you can divide up songs. Is that I don't know. I don't know. But that's what that's what the lawyer I was speaking to suggested that what he felt was going on, having seen what happened with estates like the Marley estate, because that kind of disagreement, oftentimes those children, you know, they might have different step parents they might or might not get on they might mm. have the same kind of egos that their their parents had and uh those disputes are massively expensive and before you know it it's all gone and i think uh sorting it out now is is the is the is the idea and he's got dylan's got loads so much material left to come out that mm. i think you know that it, it probably needs someone 
who knows what they're doing to manage it, you know, rather than just yeah. a, a member of his family. Yeah, and he, his 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 management company were brilliant. Actually, they were great to deal with. They were, he's always been very proactive about people writing. He, very happy to sign stuff off. Whereas with 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 the Beatles catalog, it was completely different. It was never going to happen, and um, which is really refreshing because it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, but he actually welcomes people writing about him, and 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 I, I've known some people. I've met authors since uh, the book's been published who got similar amounts of lyrics for free uh, because because they knew they were on hard times, and they were like, yeah. "Don't worry, we'll wave the check," which I think is really oh, outstanding. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. there's not a lot of money in academic books, and this is an academic publisher, so there's no advance or anything. Mm. Um, and they, they didn't ask for much. That's for a lot less than I thought they were going to ask for. Uh, and, um, yeah, they, so it, it doesn't have to do that. So it's kind of cool that, that I think, again, that's to do with legacy. And I guess, uh, you know, if you imagine how much you would get for a song being featured in a commercial or a movie compared to a book and... and um, no, people might not necessarily say nice things about him in a book, but yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of it's good that he does. That, I think it's a it's sign of maturity, I guess, as an artist. He's maturing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just think he knows what he's doing, and I yeah. don't think you get to be in that position for that long without being really good at it. And yeah. obviously, you're going to put a foot wrong here and there, but to still be in that position, he. And and he's been there since he was twenty one, which is it's incredible, on his own, yeah. on his own, not at a band around him, on his own. Yeah, amazing. That's, that is really is an incredible achievement. All right, okay. One more time for the camera. There we go. Dylan Leonard Marks and God. Dylan Cambridge Leonard Marks and God. Cambridge University Press. Uh, Excellent. Very reasonably priced for an academic book. Only twenty pounds for hardback. Ten pounds for the download. Nice. Uh, I'm genuinely glad you enjoyed reading it. Oh, I loved it, honestly. I really did. And uh, really? Ben's ben seen how many notes I made. <laughs> so it's, about, pages. it's about a fifth of the book, yeah. <laughs> a fifth, only a fifth. Where, where should people buy it from, John? Should, is, is Amazon the best place or is that not it's, good for Yeah, it's in all the books. To be honest with you, you make so little out, out of academic books. It doesn't really... I just want it out there. So I, mm. I genuinely don't mind. Obviously, if you've got a bookseller, that'd be great. Or if you get it from Amazon, for me, I'm, I'm not... I'm, I mean, obviously, a nice progressive bookshop where you're going to help people in your local community would be great. But I don't know whether... I don't know if they'll stock it, you know. Mm. Um, or you could order it from them or... Or anyway, it's but the Cambridge University Press did did um, take a decision to make it reasonably priced, which was great. So it's under twenty quid for the hardback, which is incredible because normally academic books they can be like one hundred and fifty quid. You're just never going to sell any. So I was yeah. really pleased with that, and that was very very good of him to do that. So awesome. and yeah. Ben, what have you got going on? You mentioned something earlier. Come. Oh, uh, yes. Well, thanks for reminding me. Um, uh, well, I do. I do a um, Bob Dylan podcast, and um, uh, there's a radio network in America called iHeartRadio, and they make podcasts, and they have um, loads of big pop stations out there, and um, they have commissioned a um, podcast called Blood on the Tracks, and they've done a couple of seasons of it already. Um, and I'm writing. I've written the third season, um, and the idea of the podcast is it's all about you know musicians um the first two seasons were on john lennon funnily enough and mm. uh, phil specter and about musicians that have um, been involved in murders uh the third season is about bob dylan no murder obviously um but we just look at his life from the the motorcycle crash to now and you know the sort of lives he's lived because he he always talks about you know being reborn so many times um mm. so we basically look at the lives of bob dylan from 66 to now and it's uh it's it's fictionalized um and like you were saying earlier john you kind of it's, it's difficult because you're trying to you're trying to squash everything together um so we have had to play fast and loose with some facts but i'd say 98 percent of it is is cast iron fact and we've used sources and everything um so the, the general idea is that dylan's had his motorcycle crash and he's recovering um at the house of a local doctor which is true and um he's flashing forward in his life and flashing back and he's telling us these great anecdotes from his life um so it comes out by the time this goes out it'll be out um yeah there's 10 episodes and it's called blood on the tracks brilliant fantastic brilliant. you did a great series on blonde and blonde i listened to that a few a few months ago you did a oh, multi-parter yeah. on that for Bob Dylan album by album, right? Yeah, and that's just yeah. come back as well. I've so I've so the last two or three months I've 
but I brought back my podcast, Bob Dylan Album by Album, and I've been writing this thing. So I've been writing about 20,000 words on Bob Dylan every week. I, 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 I am sick of him at this stage. But... <laughs> oh, no, you're not. No, yeah. But every, every night I say to my wife, this is, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to have a break on this. But then, you know, the next morning I'm starting again. So it's kind of like it keeps dragging me back in. I can't stop. Yeah. It's an addiction at this, phase, at this, at this moment. And if you leave it, I identify with that. Yeah, and if you leave it for a while, then the magic comes back, doesn't it? If you, I know, yeah. If you distance yourself for a while, because <laughs> there's so much there, you know. And, That's uh, the thing. It's you know, it's there's so many directions to go in. Like I'm sure you found that, John. You you end up, you know, you think, oh, there's not much to write about, and then you know, um, I'm fascinated with the ephemera. I, like, I like all the stuff around it now. All the the alternate takes and the different live versions, and the, yeah, mm. there's just so much. And then you can go back to the classic recordings and go, wow, this is why this is brilliant. I, I understand why I fell in love with it, and and the message in the political songs that so inspired me when I was at university. You know the. Uh, from the protest the album stuff just just incredible just i mean mm. it's real real art um yeah and very few people i think have got uh, got to that level of expression in, in popular music this kind of canonical it's not really fashionable to say it but it's it's the sort of western pop canon i suppose i, th I think mm. i would defend that uh, in the case of that those two artists for sure so dense isn't it yeah but it's it's yeah. almost a shame that not a lot of artists have got that because then you just find yourself listening to one or two artists all the time <laughs> yeah but, you know yeah, that's the way right. it is yeah all right well listen thank you very much thanks for everyone for listening and thanks for both of you stay on the line i'm gonna stop this recording and um to the listeners i'll see you again soon goodbye oops